Good day to you. This is Brother Lee Cadenhead, and uh, we did not get a good recording on the message tonight, and it is a subject that is foundational to some other matters that we're going to take up in the coming messages over the coming uh, few services here at Ridge Road, and so I feel the necessity to go back and try to re-record this material. I've got great respect for anybody that can sit down in the presence in front of a microphone and uh, record a radio broadcast. That's a special gift, and I don't have it, so you bear with me as we recover this material. Uh, I'm much more comfortable in front of a group, group of people rather than just in front of a microphone, but I'll do the best I can. This subject that I'm taking up is a very important one, and it's a very controversial one as well. There are a couple of subjects that are, that are especially controversial in Christendom today, and one of those, one of those would be the authority and infallibility of the Word of God and something that sets our church apart for most. Uh, is our position on the King James Bible. And uh, if you've listened to, to us preach and listened to the radio broadcast, you're probably familiar with that. Uh, we stand on the King James Bible, and we're not going to apologize for that, but that's rare in our day and time. And another thing that's pretty controversial in our day and time is our position on tongues, signs, and healing, and the charismatic movement. And uh, that's what we're going to take up uh, in this message and the coming messages. And uh, I would encourage you, before you uh, turn off the CD or change stations on the radio dial to hear sound, and we'll try to uh, we'll try to address this with some compassion. We'll try to address this intelligently, but most of all, we want to address this subject from the Bible. My experience is not important. I wouldn't expect it to be important to you. Your experience, uh, with all due respect, is not important to me. Bottom line, what is important is the absolute standard of the Word of God, and that has got to be the measure by which we try everything else. And uh, certainly the biblical doctrine of tongues ought to be taken not from, uh, not from your favorite preacher, not from, your, uh, not from the uh, latest book that you read, unless those have, uh, have been drawn from the authority of the Scriptures. What we need to know is what does the Bible say about this subject. So if you're following along in the Word of God, we'll begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and then go to chapter 1 uh, to lay a foundation to look at uh, what the book of Acts specifically says about the biblical doctrine of tongues. A few years ago, I had a, a good brother in the Lord, and I, I do love him, uh, although he's, uh, he was and is steeped in this uh, charismatic and movement of tongue signs and healing. And he gave me a, a pamphlet or tract at the time. I showed him at the time what the Bible said about the gift of tongues. And in turn, he gave me a, uh, a tract or pamphlet from one of his favorite Bible teachers, a fellow named Kenneth Hagin. Uh, Kenneth Hagin has uh, passed away now, but... Uh, he left with us some uh, some writing and so forth, and he written he's written a, a pamphlet ref, uh, called entitled "Why Tongues." And the first part of this pamphlet uh, is is on the subject of what he calls the Bible way to receive the Holy Spirit. And I can I hate the brother spent a dollar on this pamphlet anyway. Uh, Kenneth Hagin begins this pamphlet in Why Tongues on the subject of the Bible way to receive the Holy Spirit. And I quote, he says, The infilling of the New Testament believers with the Holy Ghost should be our pattern today. He goes on to say, I propose we look at the Acts of the Apostles, see how they did it, and follow their example in getting people filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, all Pentecostal and charismatic preachers and teachers, and when they set forth any sort of biblical foundation for the use of and practice of tongues, they do so from the book of Acts, that is, if they have any biblical foundation at all. We, uh, we will go tonight to the Acts of the Apostles to take up this subject of tongues and to lay a foundation for, for the study of the present day use of tongues. And, uh, that's really, to, to tell you the truth, that's not our main concern. Our main concern is what does the Bible say? say about this doctrine of tongues. And I do want to begin with a verse of Scripture out of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to lay a foundation for this matter. And it's found in verse 22. This is something that um, 
that uh, you'll very rarely, I don't know that I've ever heard a Pentecostal charismatic preacher quote this verse of Scripture in his discussion of tongues because it is the death blow to this modern day uh, exercise of tongues. But it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22, it says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, but prophesying serveth not for them that, uh, that believe not, but for them which believe. So according to the Word of God, there it is, black and white, in your Bible, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, that tongues are not for believers. They are a sign for them that believe not. Now that's going to be a foundational truth when we come to the book of Acts to determine how this, uh, how this uh, gift is used when it first arises in the Acts of the Apostles. I also want to get 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, because it's a very important cross-reference from chapter 14 verse 22 it says in 1 Corinthians 1 22 it says for the Jews require a sign it says the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom so who are the signs for they are for the Jews now interestingly enough when uh, when Kenneth Hagin comes in this pamphlet to address the use of tongues in the book of Acts and how you can receive the Holy Ghost I tell you how you can receive the Holy Ghost get saved that's how you receive the Holy Ghost when Kenneth Hagin however sets forth uh, receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking by the way uh, uh, these preachers equate receiving the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the filling of the Holy Ghost they equate those experiences with speaking in tongues. They're never equated in the Word of God, however. But he sets forth Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, 10, and 19. Now that's pretty interesting because when you read Acts chapters 8 and 9, there is no mention of tongues in those chapters whatsoever. Now, that's pretty interesting that he would take two chapters to prove that you ought to speak in tongues when you receive the Holy Ghost when there is no mention of tongues among the Samaritan believers in Acts chapter 8. There is no mention of tongues in, uh, at uh, Paul's conversion and his uh, subsequent filling of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 9. There, uh, you might be surprised to find out that there are only three instances in the Acts of the Apostles, three chapters out of 28 chapters, where tongues are mentioned and the gifts of tongues uh, are exercised. And you'd get the impression from some preachers that it's in every page, on every page, and in every chapter in the book of Acts. It's not. It's only used three times, and we're going to take up each of those three times tonight in this study to try to thoroughly understand the biblical doctrine of tongues. And as we come through this material, we're going to try to answer at least three questions in each one of these instances. Number one, who had the gift? To whom was the gift given? Secondly, how or in what manner was the gift exercised? And thirdly, what was the purpose of the gift when it was exercised? The first time that it's mentioned is going to be in Acts chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible, turn with us to Acts chapter 2. Now the gift of tongues is mentioned in Mark chapter 16, and we will come back at a later time and uh, try to thoroughly cover that material in Mark chapter 16. It's uh, taken out of a lot of new Bibles. It does belong in the Word of God, but it is often misunderstood. However, the first time that you find the gift of tongues in the book of Acts, as uh, you'll not be surprised to know, it's in the second chapter of Acts, and it's related to the day of Pentecost. As a matter of fact, a multitude of different denominations actually take their denominational name from this chapter and from this occurrence, which is very interesting when you get to reading uh, the actual, actually what the Bible says, about this uh, about this uh, day of Pentecost. But in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see the first use of the gifts of tongues in the book of Acts. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now I want you to notice first and foremost that this is a Jewish feast day. It's one of three Jewish feast days, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, that every able-bodied Hebrew male was to journey to Jerusalem to celebrate. It was Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So, Pentecost is one of those is one of those feast days, and so you have here represented in Jerusalem, among these Jewish peoples, Jews out of every nation on the earth, it's going to tell us later on in this same passage. And they are here to celebrate 
celebrate a Jewish feast day that happens 50 days after the Feast of Passover. And so there's a great company of people, which is one of the reasons why the Lord chose this particular day but to begin the preaching of the death and the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and to begin His church. So they are gathered here on the day of Pentecost. It says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, um, you do need to locate in verse 1 the antecedent to they. Who is the they that were all with one accord in one place? And the general answer is, uh, is the 120 disciples from Acts chapter 1 verse 15. And indeed, that could be. That's generally how it's understood. But I give you something to think about in this respect and, and hopefully this will help us address the first question that we wanted to answer which was, who had the gift? But in Luke chapter 24, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord, appears to the eleven apostles. Now, this is very important that you understand that. And he tells the eleven apostles to go to Jerusalem and to wait there for the promise of the Spirit. And then we're told in Acts chapter 1, verse 13, it names the eleven apostles and it says that they are abiding in this upper room. And then it turns around and tells you that in those days Peter stood up in the midst of these 120 disciples and so forth. So it could have been the 120 disciples that is the they that's referenced in verse 1, but it also could be limited to the eleven plus the newest apostle, which is Matthias, this found in chapter 1, verse 26. Now, I can tell you this, when it comes down to standing up and preaching in this gift of tongues, as we're going to see in just a moment, on the day of Pentecost, this preaching is limited to Peter and the eleven other apostles. And you know that without a shadow of a doubt, because in chapter 2, verse 14, it says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven apostles... With the eleven, lifted up his voice and began to preach. And then at the end of his sermon, in verse 36, turn around in verse 37, and it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles. So when it comes down to the exercise of this gift of tongues, it is twelve Jewish apostles on a Jewish feast day preaching to a Jewish audience about the death of a Jewish Messiah. Very important as we lay a foundation for understanding this passage of Scripture. And it says in verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now I want you to notice in verse 2 that if you were looking for, in Acts chapter 2, if you were looking for some initial evidence of the Holy Ghost, which by the way, you hear that tossed around quite a bit, that is not a biblical term at all, the initial evidence evidence of the Holy Ghost, that's a false Pentecostal doctrine that you find in various denominations. The initial evidence of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 is not the gift of tongues at all. It's a sound. It's a sound as a rushing mighty wind. I had a buddy in college. I did, uh, I did one semester at the University of West Florida. I sometimes speak of it kind of like uh, doing hard time in a penitentiary or something. It was a miserable semester. And uh, if you want to get around the most rotten bunch of infidels and quacks in the world, go to some major university somewhere and enroll in the religious and uh, philosophies, uh, the humanities department. That's where they're at. You can find them every time in that location. But uh, me and two other men, two other brothers, uh, were the only Christians in two classes. We had two classes together. And this one brother, his, uh, his name was David, he, uh, he expressed he was steeped in this movement as well. He, he said that he had a uh, Acts chapter 2 experience, the way he described it. And he said that one day he was laying in his bed, and listen, I wasn't there, I don't know, I couldn't refute him. Uh, you can't, see, that's the problem with going by experience. You can't argue with somebody about their experience. Okay, you can't refute somebody's experience. That's why you got to go on the basis of the Word of God, because the Word of God is objective. Your experience is not objective. David said that he was laying in his bed shortly after getting saved, and that he, he was awoken by the Lord, and that his window had been opened, and that that a, a wind was rushing through his room and that he began to speak in some sort of ecstatic utterance. Now, that's very interesting, and he referred to that as his Acts chapter 2 experience, but that wasn't what happened in Acts chapter 2. It didn't say the rushing mighty wind swept through this upper room. It said that the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. 
Okay, so understand that there is an initial evidence here. There is a audible sound to give them the proof that the Holy Ghost has indeed come. I want you to also notice in verse 2 that it says, And it filled all the house where they were sitting. It does not mean, it does not say or even indicate uh, to the contrary. It says they're sitting. They're just simply sitting. They're not singing off a wall the same praise and worship chorus over and 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 over again, waiting for something to happen. They're not weeping and wailing at an altar, trying to pray through. They're not slapping one another upon the back, encouraging, encouraging them to have the gift. There, there's nothing like that going on whatsoever. They're simply sitting, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit as the Lord Jesus Christ had instructed them to. And it says in verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. So not only do you have an audible sound in verse 2, you have a visible sign in verse 3, and that visible sign, that visible appearance, is cloven tongues like as a fire. Now this is a very important matter of grammar that you're going to need to know to study the Bible, like and as are what we call similes. So when you read in verse 2 that there's a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, it doesn't mean that there's a rushing mighty wind. It means that there's a sound at like, as, in a similitude to a rushing mighty wind. And in verse 3, it does not say that there are literal fiery tongues. It says there's the appearance of cloven tongues like as of fire. Now there's a terrible mistake made by many commentators preachers and expositors when they come to verse 3. This is not and cannot be the uh, sometimes uh, uh, professed baptism of fire that John the Baptist spoke of back in Matthew chapter 3. Number one, there's no fire here. There's cloven tongues like as of fire. They're not located, by the way, in anybody's mouth. They are sitting upon each of these apostles or these disciples present in this upper room. The baptism of fire. Well, let's go back. The baptism of John, the baptism of repentance in Matthew chapter 3, was a baptism by immersion. There can be no question about that. Jesus Christ went down into the water in that passage. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is an immersion. When you're baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, you are immersed into the body of Christ. The baptism of John was a baptism in water by immersion. The baptism of the Spirit is a baptism by immersion immersion into the Spirit, and the baptism of fire is also by immersion. It's not a cloven tongue like as a fire sitting upon anybody's head. It is it is the payment. Here, here's the bottom line. If you don't get baptized, if you don't get saved, you won't get baptized in the Holy Ghost. If you don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will die in your sins, and then you will be baptized in fire when God casts you into the lake of fire for rejecting Jesus Christ. So notice that in the passage, uh, there's a, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. Verse 4 it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, there's the first thought, and began to speak with other tongues, there's the second thought, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want you to notice that being filled with the Spirit and speaking with other tongues are not used interchangeably in the Bible. They are not the same thing. Now in this passage, we cannot deny, would not want to deny, that this is a gift given by God to confirm this great gospel message at the beginning, at the birthday, we might say, of the church. But in verse 4, they're filled with the Holy Ghost, and they begin to speak with other tongues. Now, let me ask you a question. This may sound kind of silly, but we've got to go here if we want to understand this passage. Did God reach out of heaven, take the fleshly member out of their mouth, and replace it with a different one? Well, of course he didn't. If they, if they did not get a totally different physical member in their mouth, then what does it mean to speak in another tongue? Well, we're going to see in the remainder of this passage that tongues in this context and every other context like it is a reference to a known language. 
It is not a reference to the physical member in your mouth. It is not a reference to some kind of uh, nonsensical syllables of gibberish that nobody can understand. It is a known language. Look at verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem. Remember 1 Corinthians one twenty-two. And the Jews require a sign. Verse 5 says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now this is very important too. You're told several times in this passage. Verse 5, you're told they're Jews. Verse 10, you're told they're Jews and proselytes. Verse 14, ye men of Judea, Jerusalem. Verse 22, ye men of Israel. This is very important. This is not like walking into a church in Bruton, Alabama. These are law-abiding, bearded, uh, 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 pork-abstaining, temple-worshipping Jews that are gathered for for a Jewish uh, feast in Jerusalem. So this it is very, very important that we understand this because the Jews require a sign and tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe believe not, according to First Corinthians fourteen twenty two. And it says in verse six, Now when he now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Now look why they're confounded. They're not confounded because they can't understand what anybody's saying. They're not confounded because these apostles have gotten up instead of started talking in gibberish. They're confounded it says, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Here are Jews from every different corner of the earth. It says there in verse 5, from every nation under heaven, and from all, with all those different native tongues gathered in Jerusalem, they are hearing the gospel preached in their own language. Now that really is a miracle. And it says in verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to Another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They were amazed because these unlearned fishermen that are standing up and preaching are preaching in languages that they've never personally learned. And these men that are gathered out of every nation under heaven are hearing in their own language. And it says in verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? See, you compare Scripture with Scripture. A tongue is a language in the passage. And it says in verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now listen. If they had been talking in unintelligible syllables that did not make any sense and that they could not understand, how would they have known that they spoke the wonderful works of God? This doesn't remember this doesn't resemble anything you've heard in church lately, friend. This is these are unlearned men standing up and speaking in a multitude of languages that they've never studied to propagate the gospel to every nation on the earth. It's an amazing thought, but within two months of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, every nation under the sun has heard that Christ died and rose again. Amazing. It says in verse 12, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. And as we said in verse 14, Peter stands up with the eleven, lifts up his voice and begins to preach to these Jewish men gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. Now, so we've answered who had the gift. The apostles had the gift. We've answered how or in what manner was the gift exercised. These men were preaching in languages that were unlearned to themselves so that other men from all over the world could hear in their own language. And what was the purpose of the gift? The purpose of the gift was a sign to unbelieving Jews so that they might hear the gospel and know with a certainty that Christ was really risen from the dead. Now, I want you to notice one other thing. Verse 37 says, Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, verse 38 is the foundation to a lot of really, really messed up denominational and religious groups. It says in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, that's in the Word of God. 
The Holy Spirit inspired Peter to say that, and that was the plan and the pattern that uh, by which 3,000 souls were saved. But you'll not find that repeated another place in the Word of God. You'll not find that in any other any in any of Peter's other preaching. You'll not find it in John's epistles. You'll not find it in James' epistle. You'll not find it in anything remotely that Paul preached or taught or wrote about. This is something that's unique to these Jewish men on this day of Pentecost. It says, verse thirty nine, for the promises unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. Notice this. In the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Listen. If you wanted to be a Pentecostal, okay, and if you want to take your salvation experience from the from the pattern set forth in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost, and if you want to have the same exact experience that three thousand souls had on the day they were saved in Pentecost, you know what? You wouldn't talk with tongues. You wouldn't speak in tongues. There are 3,000 souls saved, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and they gladly received the Word of God, and they were baptized, and there is no record or indication that one single soul out of 3,000 spoke with other tongues. It was limited to the apostles to preach to these men so that they might hear that Christ had died and resurrected and ascended back to the Father. So uh, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's our coverage of Acts chapter 2, and that is, how the, that is how the gift of tongues is used in this first instance in the book of Acts. Now, the purpose of the gift, again, was for a sign to unbelieving Jews to confirm the words of the apostles. The second instance of the tongues used in the book of Acts is found in Acts chapter 10. Now, I want you to uh, keep in mind now, as you study the book of Acts, and as you look over this material in particular, the transitional nature of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, right on through Acts chapter 7, they are, there is an exclusively Jewish audience that is hearing the preaching of the apostles. Right up until Stephen, when he's preaching to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7. And they decide to beat his brains out with stones and to reject the the gospel invitation, turn around in Acts chapter 8, and Samaritans are getting saved. Gentiles are getting saved in Acts chapter 8. You turn around in Acts chapter 8, and there's a soul Ethiopian eunuch out there in the desert. The Holy Ghost takes Philip way out of his way to witness and tell this one man about the finished work of Jesus Christ, dying a substitutionary death in his place, and he believes the gospel by faith in Acts chapter 8, and then is baptized, and his conversion is no different, friend, than mine and than yours. So there's a transition taking place in this Acts of the Apostles going from the Jew to the Gentile. And not only and, and, and you see this talk beginning to take place in Acts chapter 8, and then in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle of the Gentiles, Saul of Tarsus, is saved on the road to Damascus. And now in Acts chapter 10, now, now the Lord can't show Peter Colossians chapter 1. He can't show him Ephesians chapter 2. He can't straighten him out on this Jew versus Gentile thing thing from Paul's epistles because Paul just got saved in Acts chapter 9. There is no New Testament Scripture written at this time. But the Lord is about to prove to Peter that he's got a plan not only for the Jewish nation, he's got a plan for Jew and Gentile in the same body getting saved in the same fashion by believing on Jesus Christ. And that's what, that's what we see when we come to Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius has a vision of an angel sending him to fetch the apostle Peter. And Peter, uh, along the same lines, has a vision of a great sheep coming down three different times with all kinds of unclean animals. And the Lord tells him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, true to form, he says, No, Lord, I've never put anything unclean in my mouth. And the Lord rebukes him for it. And apparently he gets, the, he gets the picture because shortly thereafter, three Gentiles show up and say, we need you to come back to Caesarea so that you can preach to Cornelius and his household. And Peter and his Jewish entourage go with these, uh, with these Gentiles to preach to Cornelius. And I can imagine from reading the rest of this passage that Peter is a little bit skeptical of why. He doesn't really understand why yet the Lord hasn't preached to the Gentiles. See, he's still under the impression at this stage that this thing is exclusively for Jews. And we 
we can praise God today. It's not exclusively for the Jews. And then in verse, uh, by the time Peter gets there, Cornelius has got all of his kinfolk and all of his friends and family gathered to the house, waiting on Peter, waiting to hear from this man of God uh, on this subject that the angel told him to go fetch Peter for. And it says in verse 34, Peter begins his sermon to Cornelius and his household. And then said Peter, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So Peter's beginning to come around a bit. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel. See the emphasis there? Peter's still trying to keep this to himself in a national respect. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So again, the emphasis Peter is making is on the nation of Israel and on John's ministry and on Judea and so forth. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we... It's almost, again, a sound of exclusivity. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, see the attitude again, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded, here Peter speaks to come full circle. And he speaks to be led of the Holy Ghost to give them the right gospel plan so that Gentiles can begin to be saved uh, and be put in the same body as these Jews. He said, verse 22, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Now, this is one of the most important passages historically in your Bible, Acts chapter 10, verse 43. As a matter of fact, this entire account is so important that the Holy Spirit is going to turn around in Acts chapter 11 and repeat the whole thing for emphasis as as Peter gives testimony to what he's just seen in Acts chapter 10. It says in verse 43, To him, speaking of Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, I want you to notice that doesn't sound much like Acts 2.38. This is a this is this is a transitional time period, and he presents the gospel to these Gentiles and tells them all you have to be, do to have your sins remitted is believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Very interesting. And what happens when they hear this? I'll tell you what happens. And it's an important lesson that we can learn. Listen, you want to get saved? You don't have to be in a church. You don't have to have a preacher. You don't have to respond to an altar call. You don't have to weep. You don't have to listen. You want to you want to be saved. Have have your sins remitted. Be given the gift of eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Because it says, verse forty four. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. See these Jews that had come with Peter; they're amazed. They didn't realize that Gentiles could receive the Holy Ghost. They didn't realize Gentiles get saved the same way they did. See what? Uh, okay, so, so back to our questions. Who had the gift? Cornelius and his household had the gift. How or in what manner was the gift exercised? Look, watch it now. Verse 45 or verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, if they were talking in gibberish, how did they know they were magnifying God? And even stronger, even stronger argument than that, when you come to chapter 11, verse 17, Peter is recounting this entire thing. And he says, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as He did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus, what was I that I could withstand God? He says the same thing happened to Cornelius and his household that happened to us in Acts chapter 2. It's a known language unlearned by the speaker. So, the manner was the same as it was in Acts chapter 2. A language that these people had never learned or studied, and they're speaking it at the, at the unction of the Holy Spirit. And what was the purpose of the gift? Well, let me, let me finish reading here. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid what these should not be baptized, which receive the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they to te- him to tarry certain days. So what was the purpose of this gift? Well, remember 1 Corinthians fourteen twenty two. Uh, is tongues are for sign, not them that believe, but to them that believe not. 
Well, they're Jews there, and they're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't at this stage believe that Gentiles can be saved and receive the Holy Ghost. So the Lord sends this, this gift so to prove to unbelieving Jews that Gentiles can be saved even as them. Very, very important. It's a sign to Jews that did not believe Gentiles could be saved in confirmation of a new doctrine from God. Acts chapter 19, the third and final usage of tongues in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 19, it says in verse 1. Now, I want you to notice also, now as we come through all this, you're going to notice that each one of these occurrences of the gift of tongues is associated with the apostolic ministry. Okay, that's important. Here it is. Here it's the, uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 10, it's associated with the ministry of the Apostle Peter. Here it's associated with the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So this gift, each time it's used in Acts, is associated with these apostles that have the signs that were promised by the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 16. The signs, wonders, and miracles that would be the confirmation and the, and the proof of the apostolic ministry. We find in Acts chapter 19, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. I want you to notice also verse 8, it says, And he went into the synagogue. I want you to notice, first of all, that there is a large Jewish population in this region and, and city of Ephesus. There has to be because there's a synagogue here. If there wasn't a large Jewish population, there would be no need for synagogue. And I want you to notice the number of men here. There are 12 disciples of John. Now, if you're familiar with Bible, Bible numerology, you'll know that the number 12 is repeatedly in the Scripture associated with the nation of Israel. Now, it does not say in this passage expressly that these are Jews, but you can be assured that these are either Jews by birth or they're Jewish proselytes because they've partaken of the baptism of John. John the Baptist had a Jewish ministry announcing and making straight the paths of the, for the coming of a Jewish Messiah. So there's overwhelming evidence in this passage to indicate that these are Jews. Remember 1 Corinthians one twenty two: The Jews require a sign. And when Paul encounters these disciples of John, he, he says, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Now, we need to understand something about this passage. These are believers to the extent that they have heard, they believe what they have heard. Okay? They believe, they have believed the message and the preaching of the prophet John the Baptist. And they believed it so much that they are following it here over 20 years after John the Baptist had his head lopped off. Okay? So they're, they're died in the wool followers and disciples of John the Baptist. And they, what, now, now they're going to need the confirmation of this gospel message with some signs because their background, because they weren't present in Acts chapter 2. They haven't even heard of the Holy Ghost. They, that's what they say. They say to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said to them, Under what then were ye baptized? They said, Under John's baptism. Understand from this passage, these were believers in John's message, but they are not saved and born again in the New Testament sense of the term. You say, how do you know that? Well, because you can't get saved without Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is not the Savior. They've heard of John the Baptist. They're not familiar with this Jesus. You can't get saved without Jesus. Now, these people, these people are as right with God as they know to be. They've responded to the light that God gave them, and because of that, God's going to give them more light. But they're not saved in the New Testament sense of the word, and they haven't been born again. And the reason we know that is because the Holy Ghost is the way that you get born again. They haven't even heard of the Holy Ghost. They don't even know if there is such a thing. 
And then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on Him which should come after Him, that is on Christ Jesus. So Paul says to these fellows, listen, i got great news for you. You don't have to wait on the Messiah that John the Baptist preached about. He's already come, and He didn't only come, He died and was buried and rose again and ascended back to the Father, and you need to believe on Him because He's the Savior of the world. And guess what? They respond. Now, how is Paul going to get these disciples of the God-sent prophet, John the Baptist, rooted and grounded and confirmed and assured in the message of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you how. Listen, he can't appeal to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They haven't been written yet. So he's going to preach to them the gospel, and then he's going to confirm that gospel with signs to follow. 1 Corinthians 1.22. 1 Corinthians 14.22. So he tells about Christ Jesus, and it says verse 5, and they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And look at verse 6. This is unique. I mean, we haven't seen this in Acts 2. We haven't seen this in Acts 2, 10. It says in verse 6 that Paul laid his hands on them, then the Holy Ghost came on them, and then they spake with tongues and prophesied. So who had the gift? These twelve, what uh, looks apparently to be Jewish uh, disciples of John the Baptist, they received the gift. And how or in what manner was the gift exercised? Well, listen, if tongues means a known language in Acts chapter 2, and tongues means a known language in Acts chapter 10, why would we come to Acts chapter 19 and assume that the Holy Ghost meant it was some kind of unintelligible gibberish? I mean, that would be foolish. That denies any, any uh, uh, law or rule of Bible study. These tongues in Acts 19 are no different than the tongues in Acts 10 and the tongues in Acts chapter 2. They're known languages that are unlearned by the people that are speaking them. And what was the purpose of the gift? The purpose of the gift in the passage is as a sign to unbelievers in confirmation of the gospel. So this is very important. So as a bit of review, in each case, in each of these three cases, tongues is an actual language that is unlearned by the speaker. Secondly, you need to understand they are given as a gift by the Holy Spirit to believers. And they are given to believers as a sign in confirmation of the Word of God to unbelievers. There is no no exception to these rules. And lastly, notice that they each time are associated with a qualified apostle. And at a future date and a different message, we'll go into some more length, uh, some more uh, discourse on what qualifies an apostle with these signs and gifts. Now, in closing, in closing, I want to return to Hagen's remark that we ought to go to the, the, the Acts of the Apostles and we ought to follow that pattern. Now, listen, if you are going to attempt to follow or replicate the pattern of tongues as you find them in the book of Acts, you've got a bit of a problem on your hands. Because never in the three instances is it used in the same manner. In Acts chapter 2, the only people that are speaking in tongues are the apostles. And in Acts chapter 2, individuals receive the Holy Ghost only after they repent and are baptized. In Acts chapter 10, individual Gentiles first believe, then receive the Holy Ghost, then speak with tongues, and then they're baptized. It's not exactly the same as Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 19 is altogether, altogether different from, the, from even the previous two instances. In Acts chapter 19, first they're baptized, then Paul lays his hands on them, then the Holy Ghost comes upon them, and then they speak with tongues and prophesy. Now, let me, ta- let me ask you, if you were going to follow a pattern in the book of Acts, which one would you follow exactly? And here's, a, here's the tough truth about it. The fact is that nothing about the modern day use of tongues in local churches in the 21st century even resembles any of the three biblical examples that we've covered in this message. They are not exemplary. They are transitionary. They can be learned from. They're historical accounts. But they are not to be mimicked and replicated. Let me close with this this, uh, illustration. At the Royal Gorge in Colorado, there's a suspension bridge that spans a gray canyon. And that, the bottom of that canyon is more than one mile below that suspension bridge. Now, I got no reason to believe that that suspension bridge is not sound. 
You can safely walk across that suspension bridge. You can safely stand on that suspension bridge. In the same manner, we can come to these doctrines and these passages in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. These are parts of the Word of God inspired by the Holy Ghost no less than the rest of the Bible. But they're transitionary doctrines. They're like that suspension bridge. You can stand on them. They will support you. But I want you to notice in the, at, the, at the Royal Gorge in Colorado, on either side of that suspension bridge are huge, uh, massive walls of solid granite. Now, let me ask you something. If you are going to build a house, you can either build it on one side or another of that suspension bridge on a solid wall of granite. Or you can go out in the middle of that suspension bridge and you can construct a house there. When you come to these transitionary doctrines and passages in the book of Acts, Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19, you can build a religious following there. You can build a denomination there. Multiple denominations and religious followings have been constructed on the passages that we've looked at today. But let me ask you, why would you construct a house on a suspension bridge when you could build it on either the solid granite walls on either side of that bridge. Can I, can I suggest to you that if you can build it on that solid granite and yet choose to walk out on that suspension bridge to construct your house, you've done a foolish thing. These doctrines and these passages are no different. They are true. We may stand on them. They will support us. But woe be to the Christian who builds his spiritual life on bridges rather than on the solid ground of the epistles that set forth the doctrine of